Oh, oh sure. Oh, I'm taking them all. Hey. Uh, I appreciate it, man. What? Which? Yeah, I, 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 I forgot when your talk is. So I should have called it out. Yeah, yeah. Let's make this for the next one. Yours. What? Oh, yeah, I'm tangled. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. Awesome. Okay, Mathis. So, who then to present? Uh, well, we are going to share this. So we oh, have okay, to check okay. this a little bit. Yeah, so we can. Do you have two microphones? Yeah, we have two. Okay. So one of them is this one, one of them is this one. Okay. Uh, we have 40 minutes total, and we'll show you when it's 10 minutes left. Right. We have scarves to give out as questions if you have time for questions. All right. And water is here. Thank you. And let's make this thing. So which one do you have? It's HDMI, right? Yes. Don't okay, let me, I need to switch it to HDMI here first. Yeah, it should work. It, you may need to downscale it to... Uh, to 1024 resolution, but yeah, it, it, can, it will work probably this way as well. It will be maybe this way. Uh, we have a clicker if you want. Hello? Test? Oh, there we go. It came back. There we go. Hello? Good morning. Welcome on our third day of DEF CONF and first live session in this room. I think you already know all the important stuff, so let's just begin. Welcome, Dennis McGilmore, release engineer from Red Hat. Hi, all. I'm Dennis Gilmore. If you don't know who I am, I work on the Fedora release engineering team okay. and look after making sure we can you know, actually ship Fedora and okay. do some cool things. Let's jump into it. So after the lo I'm, we're going to take a quick step back. In the last 10 years in release engineering in Fedora, we merged core and extras. And that brought about a big amount of change. We had to write Pungy because the tooling that was used to make core was not allowed to be open sourced. Um, so we had to start from scratch in how we make the distribution, the tools that we used to pull it together. Um, so it was a big change. Then along came live CDs. And we're like, oh, you know, this is really cool. Let's add some live CDs. And then we went from you know one live CD to about fifty thousand or something right now. Some you know a huge amount. Then we added cloud images when EC2 became a thing. And I mean Fedora 14 or 15. I think 15 was the first release where release engineering produced the cloud images for you know, EC2. And then in Fedora 21 we got the additions where we then had to figure out how to go from making you know, an install DVD with a, tree, a repo of packages. And you know, at the time, I think it was about six or seven live CDs and the cloud image to making you know, 20, you know, three, di three different editions with three install trees. And you know, we had to revamp it, what we did. We added OS Tree and Atomic in the last couple of years. And then we started doing two-week releases for Atomic in Fedora 23. So now, you know, every, every two weeks we push out a new release of Fedora Atomic, which includes an install DVD. Uh, we update the cloud um, base image and the Atomic image and the Vagrant box images, though we only push out, we really only push out the Atomic side of it. We also create an updated Docker base image every two Is weeks as part of that process, which we don't push out to, you know, the greater world. But that, yeah, I mean, it sounds like a lot of stuff, but it's really not, you know, the way we produce Fedora today for up to 23 has not really changed a whole lot since the core and extras merge. We have tweaked things, we've kind of grown organically, we've added stuff, but it's the same basic We're stuff. still working on this. <laughs> Sorry, this is actually, a, it's my Samsung that's the, the other room. Here. Okay. Um, so in Fedora 24, we have been working on a whole bunch of changes and radically redoing 
what you know the, the way that we make Fedora. To, you know, I mean, it's the biggest amount of change since the Core and Extras merged. We've had a whole bunch of organizational changes. It's we're loading. Refactoring okay. So hopefully. We'll uh, we're to switching now. from so live CD creator to live media creator for live CD. And Paul Frields. And Paul. So we're, we're pulling people in from different teams as we go. So we're like, hey, you know, we really want to do this thing. We don't have the people in the team right now. Let's go reach out to you know, internal you know, DevOps or you know, into Fedora Engineering. Because uh, you know, Adam Miller reports through Fedora Engineering. He's not a you know, rel -eng person. He's just you know, working full time on doing rel -eng stuff as, you know, to, to meet the needs of you know, the Fedora, Greater Fedora Organization. So that's some of the organizational changes we've made. We've got a big change in for refactoring Punji. So the old Punji we would run um, in serial, Punji to, and feed in the kickstart, get out all the install media. It was clunky, you know, and unwieldy, and anyway, it's what it was. So the, the, with the part of the changes we're making, we're Doing the, making the install DVDs and the boot media as tasks within Koji. We use the RunRoot plugin in Koji to enable us to do that. So we can distribute stuff now and do it in parallel, which greatly speeds up the compose time. We, you know, like Fedora 23 GA compose, I think, took nine hours from the time I kicked it off to the time it was done. We're doing a compose right now in about three hours. It varies a little bit. It's between two to three hours. You know, it's much, much faster. We also run a single process. So instead of having to go off and spawn a whole bunch of different processes to do things, we run one command, and it triggers everything, keeps track of everything, actually makes sure that what we're supposed to get is what we get. Uh, we also emit fed messages at all the steps. So you, you know, if you're at home, you could follow along and see, hey, you know, the composer started, and it's, oh, it's at this stage, and it's at this stage. You know, part of the black box of Relang was that all the log files were on, a, you know, on the compose box, and they were never exposed to anybody but Relang. You'd have to you know, dig into the machine and be like, oh, you know. It, it was, it was, it was, anyway, it was terrible. But, so we have central logging. We have a whole bunch of metadata about the compose. We produce a whole bunch of JSON files that say, you know, these are the artifacts in it, these are the RPMs in it, and there's, you know, all the logging is available in you know, a central place. So if you care about, hey, why did this go wonky, 
you can go look at the log files and figure it out yourself because it's, you know, it's there, it's open, and it's available. And I don't know. It all, you know, Punji is taking over the management. So we had a bunch of shell scripts that would fire off live CDs. Punji does all of that as part of the config file. And the work on all this was mostly done, you know, I've done some stuff, but it's mostly been done by Daniel Mack because Punji, what we, what we ended up doing was we took the compose tool that is used internally to make RHEL and we pulled all the bits we wanted and we crafted it into what we had and we've come up with you know, a new Punji. So a big part of this goal is unifying the way we make RHEL and the way we make Fedora because that helps us to be more flexible, more agile, and enable you know, people to, you know, internal RHEL engine guys that need to work on a feature, they, or we need a feature done, we can pull in people easily. And you know, there's more knowledge, you know, we're sharing more resources. Um, live media creator is a pretty big change as far as live CD creation goes. I don't know if anyone knows how live CD creator worked, but <laughs> said, said, oh, it's probably me and Brian Lane are the only ones that actually know how it works. But I mean, it basically does a yum install route and then does a whole bunch of stuff on it. And at the end, you magically get a live CD. So live, CD, live media creator has actually been a tool that's existed for a long time. It gets shipped in Lorex, which is part of the Anaconda stack of packages, and it calls into Anaconda. It calls Anaconda, and Anaconda does the install to create the live media. So anyway, we get the benefit that we've instantly switched creating live CDs from YUM to DNF. It's gone from Python 2 to Python 3, which, you know, a nice things to have. It has somebody that is responsible and wants to own maintaining Live Media Creator to, you know, maintaining the tools. We've been trying for probably four years to get rid of Live CD Creator, and we've not managed to do so. We integrated it all into Koji. The, I have the last patches I need to deploy in production so that we can actually, and then there's like five lines of kickstart change to apply, and then we'll be switching to Live Media Creator for all the image builds in Fedora. Mike McLean did all the Koji devel development work, and um, Brian Lane enhanced Live Media Creator to suit the needs, and I did all the testing. Um, if you have questions at any time, feel free to ask. It, it's running in a cheroot. Um, so the, big, the big problem with live media, with, with historically with live media creator, is that the running anaconda in a cheroot didn't work. It would blow up in weird and wonderful ways. And at least the live ISO. So initially, the plan was to make um, disk images and enable Pixie to live for Atomic. Uh, they don't, the, the, the features for that don't actually run in a cheroot, so we're working with the Anaconda guys on ways to enable Live Media Creator to make all the things that we need to make. So the next thing I'm going to talk over real quick is the Product Definition Center. It's a new piece that Ralph Dean worked on. Um, it basically is a web front end and API for tracking everything that's in the Compose all the RPMs, the artifacts, et cetera, like that. That then gives us the knowledge, gives us the information that we can work with to look at automating things like the compose, the configs that define what goes in the compose, because we can say, hey, you know, something in the Docker base image has changed, let's rebuild the Docker base image, but we don't need to rebuild everything else. Or, you know, something that's in workstations changed, just rebuild that, and gives us better, it, it gives us the foundation in order to um, be able to implement rings in Fedora. And because we, we can now actually have the programmable, accessible information in order to you know, figure out what, what's in the base, what's in you know, the workstation ring, what's in the server ring, you know, what's in the different pieces. So when we first proposed this, Josh Boyer, on the rail Angeles said, why does this need a change? It doesn't need Fesco to approve it. It doesn't need, um, you know, 
it, it's self-contained. It's a relaunch thing. You know, does Fe should Fesco have the responsibility to approve it, et cetera? And the answer is really no. But we've filed changes for all the big things we're changing in release en engineering because we want to create visibility in what we're doing and enable people to come along and say, hey, that's really cool. With that information, I can now do this really cool thing that I want to do. Or you know, I want to mine the data and see you know, how much does the you know, package set change over you know, the cycle of a release or you know, in a six month period in Rawhide or whatever the case may be. It gives us you know, the ability to do that. And so you know, which re release engineering as a whole is trying to be much more accessible and transparent in what we're doing. So the next feature that I'm going to go over real quick is Koji Sign repos. Jay Grigusky from Internal Relenge has been working on this. I mean, the simple idea, like today, we're, whenever we make repos and we want to make sure the RPMs are signed, we use a tool called Mash. And you can run it from anywhere, and you know it's really cool and useful. But there's a lot of use in being able to say, you know, Koji. Give me a repo from this tag with all of these packages signed by this particular key and not have to run external tools on external machines. So that's what we're going to do. It unifies um, how we make the repos. So Bodai is going to be adjusted to, instead of calling mash in a root on you know, its back end, it's just going to say, Koji, go make me a repo for you know, the F24 updates tag. And you know we'll use the same features in um, Punji over time, and you know like redefine you know Punji. It, you know it, it gives more transparency into how things work. The the logs for Mash from Bodai, they're not publicly available. There's a whole bunch of logging that we get in Relang that no one ever sees, and you know probably no one wants to see it. But that one time you do want to see it. It's going to be there, and you know allows us to scale the work out across uh, multiple machines. The layered build, layered image builds, is the um, next change. It's something that Adam Miller has been working on. It will enable us to make layered Docker images and integrate that into Koji and ensure that we know like what goes into them and. It contains a whole bunch of stuff, the command line interface, you know, extension of that. It actually has its own, own implementation of uh, OpenShift v3 that it uses to build them. Um, you know, the inf that output is fed back into Koji. The, and we're actually, as part of this, looking at putting in our own Docker registry because the Docker registry upstream is somewhat terrible. <laughs> They don't provide you know, an API or any way to actually, in a, you know, a great way to interface with them. Um, so, you know, probably, are we going to have the crane registry in 24, or is that? Uh, 24 is going to be a Docker distribution registry. We won't have a solid answer for the SDN, but we'll, there will be a registry that will be pushing Rawhide uh, base images to as soon as they pull out of Koji. Okay. Awesome. Um, so the work for this has been done by a whole bunch of people, not just Adam, you know, Colin Walters, Tomasz Tomacek, Tim Moore, and Amanda Carter, you know, yelled at people and I'm not sure if Tomasz is here, but you know, like they yelled at people, they got resources to make sure we could get everything in place and it's probably one of the bigger changes in, you know, how we do stuff and it's going to enable us to look at you know, many more deliverable artifacts, which means that we need to be able to you know, adapt and deliver more and more and more. So we have a priority pipeline. And this is stuff that we're looking at working on in Fedora Release Engineering. We're trying to document all of the relaunch processes internally so that you know, one, internal release engineers can come and help us as need be. And 
two, you know, anyone in the community wants to help, um, you know, do stuff, it's easy for them to get involved. And in, you know, traditionally we've been pretty terrible at getting drive-by contributions. We can now actually get those drive-by contributions, and we're working more towards enabling people to come along and say, "Hey, you know, here's this thing," and we can accept it because it's really clear what you need to do. Um, but this is something that's like an ongoing project that we're trying to get towards. We're trying to develop standardized processes for everything, pretty much. And that is you know, to enable, you know, make, make things clearer, easier, enable people internally. But you know, like in my ideal world, if when, Rel when Red Hat wants to hire a new release engineer, they come and say, hey, Fedora, who's in the community has been doing really cool stuff with and helping you do you know, release engineering? And we go, oh, you know, Joe's been helping us do some really good stuff, and he's been proactive, and he understands how stuff works. And then he gets hired into Red Hat, and he's immediately useful because he doesn't have a three or six month, you know, time where he just has to learn how stuff works because, you know, it already knows, you know, he already knows how stuff works, and it, you know, Red Hat internally uses the same processes as we do. It's an area where I think Fedora, you know, is going to take a lead and define you know, how Red Hat as a company does stuff. We need to work out how we can drop I686 for different things, either stop making it entirely or um, you know, demote certain, you know, we, we need to make more flexibility in how we compose Fedora so that you know, we can promote AR64 to, for server to primary and demote everything for I3, I686 to secondary but keep multi-live enabled because people like to run Skype and Steam and other <laughs> things that come as 32-bit and Wine and most of the Windows applications are still 32-bit, et cetera. So as much as I really, really want to get rid of multi-live entirely because I, I, I keep yelling at Dan saying, you know, let's drop S390, let's get rid of the 31-bit stuff. We don't want that. Then that only leaves us with I386 on you know, the x86 as the only arch that has multi-lib. Multi-lib's a pain in the butt. I <laughs> just I would really like to kick it out the door. But you know, so we need to work out the flexibility and the tooling to enable us to, you know, send pieces of the compose to different places and redefine, you know, ultimately redefine what is a secondary arch, what is a primary arch, what is a primary deliverable, what's you know just a secondary deliverable that you know, if we make it we do if we don't, you know, sorry. Um, yeah, ensure that, yeah, whatever the case may be. We're um, going to be working heavily on release automation for Docker and Atomic because we're expecting, you know, in Fedora 25, probably three different Atomic, uh, you know, OS tree based things that. Uh, you know, the, the Peter's IoT stuff for ARM. The workstation working group came to me last week and said, hey, we want to make an atomic version of an OS3 version of workstation because they see, you know, a use case for that. Um, and, you know, we, I mean, we make the Docker base images today. We don't make any layered images. We'll use cockpit as a test case as we're testing all of the layered image stuff, but, you know, it's probably going to, we're probably going to end up with, you know, maybe 100 or 200 or more laid images. And, you know, we need to QA that. We need to, you know, make sure that what we ship is right. And we need to work out, like, things like, do we put that laid image in the same boat I update as the RPMs? Or do we, sep you know, do we do separate uh, updates for laid images? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked out as far as the release and creation of Docker and Atomic. We have a few things in our priority pipeline that are related to switching to Python 3, and we need to make everything use Create Repo C because it has a Python 3 API, and Create Repo never will. We need to you know, move things from YUM to DNF because YUM's never going to have Python 3 APIs. We want to move DVD creation into Koji as a task. So you would say to Koji, make this repo with this stuff and make sure it's signed, and Koji, go make this DVD from this repo. And you know, abstract out of, you know, the tooling and put into um, Koji 
all of the releasing. So in the end, Punji is likely to be something that will do the stuff it does today, but will also just be an orchestration layer to say, Koji, go do this stuff for us. And we need to figure out a great way to make the Docker images for all the architectures, including you know, Power, S390, AR64. So we're continuing on the priority pipeline. I actually have three slides on this, I'm terribly sorry, but I mean, yeah, two years ago, no. <laughs> there's no, there's no order, and it's just this is the kind of stuff, you know, we're, we're, we we want to get done. Um, you know, two years ago, I got asked, how can I help? You know, what things can I give someone to do to help you? And I couldn't even think of. I mean, I, there's lots of stuff, but I didn't have the time to sit down and you know write it. So I think that it's awesome that we have a big list of you know stuff that we want to do. Big thing we want to do is port everything to Python three. You know, the distribution as a whole is moving to Python 3. We really haven't done any of any work at all on that. So, you know, Punji, Mash, which we're probably just going to take out back and shoot. You know, all our LN scripts, Fed package, R package, Fedora package. Are, you know, we also want to make sure that as we do that, we write test suites so everything works. You know, a, a big thing today and that we need to work on is test suites and automation everywhere because. We're going to be doing more, 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 and do it twice as fast as we did it yesterday. And you know, we can't do that with the way that we've been doing things. You know, we need to work out how to deliver zero-day fixes quickly. So when the hot bleed comes along, when shell shock comes along, you know, we need to not be like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get that out in 24, 48 hours because that's how long it's going to take us to go through the Bodai process and get the update out to the world. You know, we're it's a problem we need to solve. We need to ensure that we can rapidly get, you know, security, critical security fixes that can compromise machines onto users' boxes quickly. The, we, one of the things in making, second, redefining secondary arches, we want to bring all the Koji hubs together. I mean, the RelEng people that do the op stuff, particularly in the secondary arch space, spend a lot of time babysitting processes that you know, mostly work, but I mean, they get it done, they mirror the builds properly. You know, we don't have the same kind of issues where Debian, like Debian, that they can, you know, one arch will link against different so names because, you know, something failed to build and they just carry on and they don't, you know, we, we try to ensure a level of consistency across all the architectures. We also want to pull in a lot of the rail processes that they use like license checking, ABI checking, RPM diff, and automate that into. So when you know when you do a commit and you push or push a new um, tarball to look aside cache, you want to check the license of everything and make sure that licenses haven't changed, that everything's licensed okay, that you know these two files in the in this tarball are actually compatible license-wise with each other, and you can link them together and you know, automate those checks because people are terrible at doing stuff like that. Um, there's, a whole, there's, there's a whole bunch of them that, you know, a big part of being flexible and faster, we also want to make sure that whenever Red Hat decides we're going to go do the next version of RHEL, that they can take what's in Fedora, take the tooling and processes, it's just a lift and shift. They lift it you know, wholesale, take it internally, and then you know, make the changes that define RHEL and you know, add their extra bug fixes and extra polish and integration and stuff like that, but make that process smooth. That you know, They start on Monday. By Friday, they've actually got to compose, not, well, we start on Monday, and you know, six months from now, we'll have you know, a RHEL compose. Make, you know, have Fedora lead what is going to be RHEL. Um, you know, we've got Koji 2.0. I'd really like to see Eraditool and Bodai. Eraditool, for those that don't know, is a tool internal to Red Hat that pushes all the errata. I would like to see for the places where we interact with Koji, with internal pro with Fedora processes, uh, with Bodai in internal processes, and Eraditool in uh, Bodai in Fedora and Eraditool in internal, where we we have a, the same. We've got ten minutes. Um, where we have the same. Um, 
you know, tooling that's talking it, rather than write two different functions with two different APIs, we put a common API into Bodai and a router tool for shared functions, make it simpler to write tools that interact with, you know, the different systems so we can, you know, share processes more. At some point, we actually want to solve the embargo problem. Sorry, I don't want to yes, sir. too much time. What is the status of Troji 2.0 right now? It is... Headline summary. The headline summary is they're still trying to figure out what exactly it's going to be. And the, the, I mean, the initial thought was that they would just go and rewrite something and start from scratch. And they're like, no, that's actually a bad idea. Let's work out how we can iteratively change and keep Koji functional while we go from you know, the 1.0 model to the 2.0 model. So they're still trying to plan exactly how they're going to do that because it's not going to be the ground up rewrite that they initially thought that would be a great idea. So decided that would be a bad idea. You know, for a long time, people wanted to be able to deal with embargo stuff. OpenGDK is a big example. When there's a security bug, we know about it beforehand. We build everything and run it through the TCK, et cetera, internally, which takes about a week before you can actually ship something. We can't do that in Fedora. We've got to wait until that CVE is public before we can you know, build it and then go through it. Because every um, OpenJDK build, I don't know if anyone knows it, they run the internal um, Java team, run it through the TCK and the Java certification and make sure that you know, it complies. So, you know, the Java's, you know, the OpenJDK and Fedora is a compliant, you know, Java. And, you know, that takes a week. So they really, you know, we can't deal well with, you know, the security bugs. And there's other, there's been a few other times where being able to have embargo, deal with embargoed issues would be nice. But as everything is open, it's somewhat difficult. We'd like to look at ways to leverage internal support people to help us deal with the basic day-to-day -day tickets, you know, sorting of things, pointing people in the right direction. You know, we need to figure out how, how to do that or, and what that actually means. We want to clean up all of our scripts. We want to... Um, so I, one of the issues with FedMessage is it doesn't guarantee delivery. And I complained to Ralph Bean enough that he wrote a thing he's called Gill Message, and it ensures that that message gets delivered. So we need to evaluate like what parts of the process that we're going to rely on Fed Message, but we want to ensure that the messages get through where we need to use Gill Message. Um, you know, we want to look at doing some gating of builds to make sure that you know, like if the surname bumps, we can have a process set up that automatically deals with that or you know, sets up side tags, things like that. Um, make sure that signing works, you know, that, you know, like have Rawhide signed. We need to work on um, tooling or on a, on a service to, you know, be able to sign Rawhide, sign Atomic Repos, sign, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of things outside of just signing the RPMs that we need to sign today. We need to work out a way to, you know, do that without a person having to type in a password because that's a big bottleneck. We want to actually Im implement Fedora rings and you know, enable us to do different things. The layered, you know, perhaps look at doing, pulling in non-RPM content into layered images. And <laughs> yeah. And the, yes, sir. What's an ALF? That, that's what was in the wiki. I copied from the <laughs> wiki page. <laughs> I nearly deleted it, but I'm like, I'm going to leave it there. It's, that's, what's in, you know, that's what's in the wiki and the priority. Um, you know, we want to finally satisfy Richard Jones's request to have some signed metadata that can be used for invert builder and to implement like simple stream stuff so you can see image. I'm not sure of the exact Yes, sir? So, I mean, related to that, I mean, Richard Jones is a rather intelligent guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. It seems like one of those things where, I mean, if it's just generating a text file, like you should, we should definitely have a process where someone like that can come in and, like, from the top, you know, mm -hmm. test a patch, contribute it, yep. and ideally see it ship. Yeah. Know, I mean, a, a so big request on video. So, yeah. well, a bit of it. A, 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 big, a big part of the issue with it today is the signing. It has to be clear signed, like we sign the checksums. 
you know, we, we, it's got the text and it's got all the GPG signature, all the, um, not GPG, but all the signature stuff inside of that text file, just like we assign checksums. And we have no way to automate that. And apparently not have, having it not signed is not an option. And that's the big issue more than the actual making the metadata that it needs, it's the signing. Um, also for the, for the um, development of the tools, so Dennis talked about previously about um, how we want to the release engineering script. So um, there's, there's already work started on, on making a Python library that makes all, that, all the different release engineering um, common processes put into uh, Python, uh, basically API. And um, there's, there's only like nine functions there right now, but we're adding to it as we go, and all of them um, have pie tests, all the functions are mocked, and we will have a policy if you create a pull request for a change, the tests must pass. Um, you know, just we're, we're, basically average due diligence, like, no. but we, we want to make that for the future because a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff now, mm -hmm. you need permission to be able to test it properly. Yeah. yeah, so the goal is to allow people who, who have uh, you know, yeah. skill set to be able to we we kind of slowly started changing, and we're now getting to a point where we're rapidly changing in how we do stuff. We um, we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there. I mean, we now have a requirement that if you're submitting something that's new, you have to put documentation in and document that thing, so that you know in our docs we have everything. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I guess you would remember the, the discussion. So Word Builder Project got this notion of an index file yep. that describes the, uh, a bunch of metadata about uh, mm -hmm. risk major study publishers. Yep. So there was a ticket um, to let the Rallings team publish uh, the index file mm -hmm. as part of Fedora Compose. Uh, uh, Fedora yeah. It's been open for two years. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, it, it, it's on our list. I mean, because of it, it's why it's here. Part of it's uh, automatic signing, and part of it is we need to work out a way to actually do it because it, at least if I understand it correctly, it needs to be done at the distribution level, not at the per release level. So it involves changing a little bit how, you know, it, it, it's, it needs to be integrated in the process, but it also needs to be somewhat separate because it needs to not be really done at like compose time, but it needs to be done when we're pushing the content live so that it. Would that be a piece of functionality that would almost come out of the PDC stuff? Possibly. I mean, it, it, we could probably look at like PDC for as an integration point and how to do that and get the data that it needs. Um, I've only got a couple minutes yeah, left. So this is really the last slide, and there's just questions. But you know, just as a whole, we want to be more flexible and proactive. We don't want to be reactive anymore. We, you know, need to be able to be move with the changing landscape as new content types, new things come along. You know, Atomic. I, I think I said a couple of years ago that you know, Docker's not the last, last shiny. Something else is going to come along. Atomic came along, and there's going to be something else is going to come along as well. And we need to be able to flexibly deliver Fedora, rapidly deliver Fedora, and ensure that we don't compromise our foundation. So that just means everything we do, it needs to be audible, accountable, reproducible, you know, done in a way so that we can be you know, confident that what we're shipping is a good thing. And to do most of this, we need to work really closely with the QA team to make sure that there's continuous integration and testing, and automated testing happens of everything. The QA guys are putting in like auto QA to test and install media and you know we're getting there. It's just gonna be lots and lots of work. So last thing. Any questions? Or come talk to me afterwards and you know feel free to yell at me or whatever. Or not. Yeah, or not. Um, so I have three scarves. Let's see if we can get three really quick good questions. And I can give them out, or I'm going to keep them. Out of time. We, ask me. That.